Hey everyone, get ready for a deep dive into PRP and all its potential in infertility. You sent us two really thorough scientific reviews, and we're going to try to break down the most relevant stuff for you. So PRP, it's actually pretty interesting. It comes from your own blood. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a concentration of platelets, which are packed with these things called growth factors. So it's like a, um, a healing cocktail. Yeah, I like that. That's a great way to put it. And it's been used already in fields like orthopedics and dentistry, even wound healing. Great. So not a brand new concept. Yeah. But you've been looking into how it's being used in reproductive medicine, right? Exactly. And we know a lot of you out there are interested in its potential for, well, a few things like thin endometrial lining, mm -hmm. diminished ovarian reserve, and recurrent implantation failure. Let's start big picture. How is PRP actually prepared for all these different uses? Well, before we get into the specifics of, you know, how it's used, we need to talk about standardization. Oh, that sounds like a problem. <laughs> well, it can be. See, the way PRP is prepared can really vary, which means the concentration of platelets and growth factors can be different depending on, well, depending on the method used. So it's not a like a one size fits all kind of thing. Exactly. And that makes it hard to compare different studies, you know, their results. Imagine you're baking a cake, but with totally different amounts of each ingredient. Okay. Yeah. Your cake is going to turn out really different each time. Makes sense. So what are some of the differences in these methods? What kind of variables are we talking about? Well, one important factor is the centrifugation. Okay. That's spinning the blood at really high speeds to separate out the components. Oh, right. Of course. But different studies use different speeds and different durations for that spinning, and that affects how those components settle. Ah, so spin speed matters. What else? Temperature matters, too. Some protocols require the blood to be kept at room temperature, while others use a specific temperature, um, like 18 degrees Celsius. And then there's the activation step. Remember those growth factors? Mm -hmm. Well, they have to be activated to be released from the platelets. Oh, so it's like you're um, unlocking their power. Yeah, exactly. And there are different ways to activate them. Some studies use calcium chloride. Others use thrombin or collagen. Huh so many variables. Yeah, I know, right? And all these variations can lead to different concentrations of those growth factors, and that could really impact how effective PRP is for different conditions. Okay, so keeping that in mind, those variations, let's move on to the specific uses. Starting with, uh, starting with thin endometrial lining, how much of a problem is that from the research you've seen for people trying to conceive, I mean? A thin endometrial lining, we usually define that as less than seven millimeters. Well, it can make it way harder for an embryo to implant and then develop. Yeah. And this is, I mean, it's a challenge for a lot of women. Right, because the embryo needs a certain thickness to kind of, I don't know, get established. Yeah, you got it. And there are existing treatments, of course, medications like estradiol or aspirin or sildenafil, mm. but they, you know, they don't work for everybody. Yeah. And that's where researchers are wondering if PRP could be another option. So what's the thinking there? Why PRP for thin lining? Well, the idea is if you inject PRP into the uterus, those growth factors could stimulate the endometrium to thicken okay. and potentially improve the chances of implantation, you know, working. So are there studies that actually show that working? There are some encouraging results coming out, like one study by um, Eftekar and colleagues, they compared PRP to a control group in women who were doing a frozen embryo transfer. Okay. And they found that PRP not only increased the endometrial thickness, it also led to a higher implantation rate. Wow, okay. And what's really interesting is that the increase in thickness was more pronounced in women who ended up getting pregnant. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so it suggests that PRP might be especially helpful for those who really have trouble with implantation. That's a big finding. Are there other studies that kind of support this? Yeah, there are. Um, Chang and their team also found that PRP improved clinical pregnancy rates in women with thin lining. So there are multiple studies sort of pointing to these potential benefits, which is exciting. It is. But of course, we have to think about the, the limitations of the studies too, right? Oh, absolutely. A lot of these studies are, you know, relatively small and we need larger, more robust trials to really confirm these findings. And don't forget, there's still a lack of standardization in how PRP is prepared, which we talked about. Right. And that can make it hard to compare results across studies. Okay. That context is important. So let's uh, let's shift gears and talk about PRP's potential for, um, for diminished ovarian reserve. This is where things get really, really interesting. The idea of potentially boosting egg supply, I mean, that's exciting for so many people. 
It is a fascinating concept. The process involves um, injecting PRP directly into the ovaries. Oh, okay. And the goal there is to try and stimulate the growth of follicles, which are, you know, the little sacs that contain the eggs. And there was a there was a case where two women who had already gone through menopause were able to conceive naturally after PRP. Yes. That case, it was from a study by um, Pantos and colleagues. And it was truly remarkable, but it's really important to remember it's just one case. Of course. It doesn't mean that PRP is some kind of guaranteed solution for everybody with diminished ovarian reserve. Right. Every case is different. Exactly. Individual responses can vary so much. Are there other studies that look at PRP for um, diminished ovarian reserve? Yeah, but they're often limited by small sample sizes, like I said. One study by Svaki Anudis and their team, they involved three women who had previously been poor responders to IVF. Meaning? Meaning their ovaries weren't producing a lot of eggs in response to, you know, the hormone stimulation. Okay. But after getting the intraovarian PRP injections, they all saw a decrease in their FSH levels. Remind me what FSH is again. Oh, sure. FSH is follicle-stimulating hormone. It's, uh, it's a key hormone involved in egg development. And levels typically rise as ovarian reserve declines. So if it went down, that's a good sign. <laughs> exactly. Seeing a decrease in FSH after PRP suggests that the ovaries might be responding to the treatment, potentially producing more eggs. And what's really interesting is that all three of these women actually went on to conceive after receiving PRP, either naturally or through IVF. That's amazing. But again, we need more research to understand like the true impact, right? You got it. We need more data to determine if PRP is really rejuvenating the ovaries or if it's, you know, something else going on. Okay, so let's move on to the last application for today, recurrent implantation failure. You mentioned before that this is a particularly frustrating area for people going through IVF. Yeah, it really is. So do you explain what it is and why it happens? Sure. Recurrent implantation failure, or RAF, it's defined as the inability to achieve a clinical pregnancy after at least three IVF cycles using good quality embryos. Okay. It's complex. There are various potential causes, you know. It could be issues with the embryos themselves or problems with the, the uterine environment. So it's like the embryos just can't get a foothold. Exactly. Even though they're, you know, considered good quality, it can be incredibly disheartening for couples going through IVF. So where does PRP fit in? What's the, the logic behind using it for this? Well, researchers are looking into whether PRP can um, improve the receptivity of the endometrium, you know, making yeah. it more welcoming to those embryos. Okay. It's like uh, prepping the soil for those little seeds to take root. I like that. So any evidence to support that idea? There are some promising findings. A study by Cox Sewer and their team, they found that PRP significantly increased both endometrial thickness and implantation rates in women with a history of RAF. They also observed a lot higher, like significantly higher, clinical pregnancy rates and live birth rates in the PRP group compared to the control group. That's incredible. Are there other studies that, that show similar results? Yep. Another study by Nazari and their colleagues, which was a randomized controlled trial, they found significantly higher chemical and clinical pregnancy rates in the group that got the PRP. So multiple studies are pointing to this potential that PRP could really help address RIF. It really is good news for couples who are struggling with this. But as we've been saying, more research is needed to really confirm these findings. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we've covered a lot here already. We talked about the preparation of PRP, the potential benefits for, well, for several reproductive challenges. A lot of challenges. And, of course, the need for more research. But before we um, before we wrap up this first part, I want to ask you about something else, something that's often on people's minds with new treatments, and that's cost and accessibility. What can you tell us about that? That's a great point. It's definitely something to think about if you're, you know, considering PRP. And um, currently, it's not typically covered by insurance for fertility treatments. So out of pocket for most people. Yeah, in most cases. And the cost, well, the cost can vary. Depends on a number of factors. The provider, the specific um, application, how many treatments you need. Right. Can you give, I don't know, a ballpark mm -hmm. of what people might expect? It's tough to give a, like a precise number, but based on what we know, PRP treatments for fertility can range, I don't know, from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars per cycle. Oh, wow. So not a not an insignificant expense. How does that compare to, you know, IVF? PRP is generally less expensive than a full cycle of IVF, which can be, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. But but it's crucial to keep in mind that PRP is often used as a supplementary treatment 
hmm. alongside IVF, not necessarily a replacement. So it's not an eaters. Right. And for some people, you know, adding the cost of PRP might not be possible, especially if you need multiple treatments. So accessibility is, yeah, it's definitely a concern. Are there any efforts to try and make PRP more affordable? More accessible, I mean. Yeah, some clinics offer financing options or package deals to help make it more um, manageable. And as research continues and PRP becomes more widely accepted, there's hope that insurance coverage might expand. That would be fantastic. <laughs> okay, before we move on, I want to make sure we're summarizing the key takeaways for our listener. So far, I mean. Sure. We started by talking about what PRP is, explaining that it's a concentrated solution of platelets those tiny cells in your blood that are packed with growth factors. And these growth factors play a huge role in healing and regeneration. Mm -hmm. Then we went into the potential benefits of PRP for, well, for addressing several different fertility challenges. <laughs> yeah, like thin endometrial lining, diminished ovarian reserve, and recurrent implantation failure. We talked about the research that's been done, pointing out both the promising results that we've seen and the need for more large-scale studies to confirm those findings. And we touched on the potential risks of PRP and the need for more research on the long-term safety. Right. And, of course, we talked about the cost and accessibility, which is a real concern for many people. So there's a lot to consider, both in terms of, like, the potential benefits and the, uh, the practical stuff. But before we get into more details about the, like, the hardcore science behind PRP. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be getting into the specific growth factors found in PRP and how they might be contributing to its effects on fertility. So stay tuned. Welcome back. So before the break, we were talking about the cost and accessibility of PRP, which is you know a big factor to consider. But let's um let's dive a little deeper into the I guess the science behind it all. What are these uh, what are these growth factors everyone's talking about? Well, think of them as like signaling molecules. Okay. They're these tiny things that play a key role in all sorts of cellular processes, you know, like healing and regeneration. The review articles you sent over, they highlighted a few key growth factors found in PRP, uh, like VEGF, TGF beta, and PDGF. Okay, so a lot of acronyms. Let's, uh, let's break those down one by one. First up, VEGF. What is that and what does it do? So VEGF stands for vascular endothelial growth factor, right? And it's super important for the formation of new blood vessels. That process is called angiogenesis. Okay, angiogenesis. And this is, you know, particularly relevant when we're talking about endometrial growth because a good blood supply is like essential for embryo implantation and development. It's like imagine building highways for nutrients to reach the developing embryo. So more blood vessels, better environment for the embryo. Makes sense. Right. And PRP can boost those VEGF levels. That's the idea. Yeah. PRP, it's got a concentrated dose of VEGF, so it could really enhance that blood supply, make the endometrium more, well, more hospitable for implantation. Fascinating. Okay, next on the list, we've got uh, 2GF beta. What's its role? TGF beta, or transforming growth factor beta, is, well, it does a lot. It's involved in cell growth and differentiation, meaning it helps cells mature and specialize. And it also helps regulate the immune system. So it keeps things running smoothly. Yeah, kind of like a cellular organizer huh. and peacekeeper. What does all that mean for you know reproductive health? Well, when it comes to the endometrium, TGF beta might be involved in like promoting healthy growth mm -hmm. and suppressing any inflammation that could mess with implantation. So it's like making sure everything's good to go. Exactly. All right, last but not least, we have PDGF. Tell us about that one. Okay, so PDGF stands for platelet-derived growth factor. Mm -hmm. This one, this one's a powerhouse when it comes to tissue repair and regeneration. Okay. It stimulates the growth of different cell types, including fibroblasts, which are essential for, well, for building the framework of tissues. Think of them like the construction workers that lay down the foundation for a strong, healthy endometrium. So PDGF is like the, the master builder. Precisely. And PRP, with its high concentration of PDGF, could really help with the repair and regeneration of the endometrium, which, you know, is especially helpful for women with thin lining or any damage from previous procedures. It's amazing all these growth factors working together. I know. It's like a, a cellular dream team. It really is. So we've talked a lot about the, the potential benefits, but let's shift gears a little bit and talk about, you know, the, the potential risks. Are there any safety concerns with PRP treatment? That's a really important question. And overall, PRP is considered safe, especially when we're talking about autologous PRP, meaning, you know, it's derived from your own blood. So like recycling your body's own healing power. Exactly. So you're minimizing the risk of like allergic reactions or disease transmission. 
But are there any, I don't know, downsides, any risks to think about? Well, there are a few things. Because PRP involves injecting a concentrated solution, there is always a chance of pain or bruising, maybe infection at the injection site. Okay, that makes sense. Anything else specific to PRP? There is some research looking into uh, the potential for PRP to stimulate not just healthy cells, but also potentially abnormal ones, like the ones involved in endometriosis or even cancer. Oh, wow. Okay. But more research is definitely needed there. We need to really understand these potential risks. So it's not, you know, completely risk-free. Yeah. And more research is needed, especially for repeated use. Hmm or for specific groups of patients. Absolutely. It's so important to have a, a good conversation with your doctor to weigh the potential benefits and risks before you jump into any treatment, you know, yeah. including PRP. Right. Okay, so let's um, let's get back to those specific applications of PRP and reproductive medicine. We talked about thin lining and diminished ovarian reserve, but let's dig a little deeper. Starting with uh, Starting with thin lining. What can you tell us about the research and what are some of the key takeaways? Well, one of the studies you provided by Eftekar and colleagues, they looked at women who were undergoing a frozen embryo transfer, specifically women who had a history of implantation failure. And they found that compared to the control group, PRP significantly increased endometrial thickness. Which we've already talked about. But it also led to a higher implantation rate. Right, right. exactly. And and you remember we talked about how the increase in thickness was even greater in the women who ultimately got pregnant. Yeah. That really suggests that PRP might be especially helpful for those who, you know, who really struggle with implantation. That's a big deal. It is. And another study by Chang and their team, they found that PRP improved clinical pregnancy rates for women with thin lining. So we're seeing a pattern here across multiple studies, which is encouraging. Very encouraging. But again, important to remember, these are still small studies. Oh, oh, for sure. We need larger studies with more participants to confirm these findings and really understand the long-term effects of PRP. Plus, remember all that variation in PRP preparation. Oh, right. That can make it harder to, you know, to draw firm conclusions. Okay. So lots of potential, but more research needed. Now, what about... Um... What about PRP for diminished ovarian reserve? What's the research say there? The research on PRP for diminished ovarian reserve is, well, it's even more limited. It often involves small sample sizes. But there are those, you know, interesting case reports, like the one we mentioned earlier, those two women who had already gone through menopause, conceiving naturally after PRP treatment. Yeah, that was amazing. It really was. But it's, it's just one case. And we really need more research to understand why they responded the way they did. Right. We can't jump to conclusions based on one case, no matter how amazing it is. Exactly. But there are other studies out there, too, like one by uh, Saki Nudis and colleagues. They involve three women who were, well, they had been diagnosed as poor responders to IVF, meaning yeah. their ovaries weren't producing a lot of eggs in response to, you know, the hormone stimulation. Okay. But... After getting those PRP injections directly into their ovaries, all three women saw a decrease in their FSH levels. And that's significant because... Because FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, is a key player in egg development. As women age, their ovarian reserve declines, and usually FSH levels go up. So seeing a decrease after PRP, that's a positive sign. It suggests the ovaries might be responding to the treatment and, you know, potentially producing more eggs. So that's promising. But again... We need to see those results replicated in larger studies to, to confirm these findings. And we have to remember there could be other factors at play, too. We can't say for sure that PRP was the, the only reason for those positive changes. Absolutely. We need, I mean, we really need more data to understand how PRP might be affecting ovarian function and what the long-term effects are. Okay, let's go to our last application. Recurrent implantation failure. Can you walk us through some of those studies and uh, and highlight the key findings? So RIF, like we said before, can be really tough on couples going through IVF. And the research on PRP for RIF, well, it's still pretty new, but there are some promising things coming out. One study by Coxsewer and colleagues, they looked at women with a history of RIF, and they found that PRP significantly increased endometrial thickness and implantation rates compared to the control group. So that lines up with what we saw in the research on thin lining. It does. Seems like PLP might be helping to create like a more receptive environment for the embryo. Yeah, exactly. And what's even more encouraging is that they also found that the clinical pregnancy rate and the live birth rate, they were significantly higher in the PRP group. So it might not just be helping embryos implant, it might be supporting their development into, you know, healthy pregnancies. That's amazing. 
Are there other studies that uh, that support these findings? Yes. Another one by Nazari and colleagues also found significantly higher chemical and clinical pregnancy rates in the group that received PRP. So again, we're seeing a pattern of positive results, which is, you know, it's exciting. It is. But it's important to remember. More research is needed. Uh -huh. You read my mind. These are still small studies. We need those large, well-designed trials to confirm these findings. Absolutely. And, and remember, the research on PRP for RAF is still pretty new. There's still a lot we don't know. We need to figure out who would benefit most from this, how it compares to other treatments out there, and, you know, what those long-term effects might be. Okay, so lots of potential, but more research needed. We've, I mean, we've covered so much today. Mm -hmm. We talked about how PRP is prepared, the potential benefits, the risks, and its applications in all different areas of reproductive medicine. It's been a lot. It has. Before we wrap things up, I want to throw out a, a thought-provoking question for our listeners. Mm. We've been talking about PRP for infertility, but mm. what if we think bigger? What if we like broaden our view beyond reproductive medicine? Mm. Could PRP have applications in other areas of, I don't know, health and wellness? Now, that is an interesting question. If we're connecting this to the bigger picture, remember those growth factors, mm. VGF, TGF beta, PDGF. They're not just part of reproductive processes. They're essential all over the body. Yeah. We already see PRP being used for things like wound healing, sports injuries, even hair loss. So theoretically, PRP could be used to promote healing and regeneration and like a bunch of applications. Exactly. What if we could use it to speed up the healing of fractures, repair damaged cartilage, maybe even treat neurodegenerative diseases? There are so many possibilities. Wow. PRP could really be a game changer in so many fields of medicine. It really could. And while a lot more research is needed, I mean, to really explore all these possibilities, it's, uh, it's something to watch for sure. Okay. So we've gone through a ton of information in this deep dive. Before we... Um, before we wrap up, let's summarize the key takeaways for our listeners one last time. So we started by talking about what PRP is, that concentrated solution of platelets from your own blood. And those platelets are packed with these growth factors that can really stimulate healing and regeneration. We explored the potential benefits of PRP for those different fertility challenges, like thin endometrial lining, diminished ovarian reserve, and recurrent implantation failure. And we really went into the research highlighting the promising findings, but also, you know, the need for more studies to really solidify things. We also talked about the potential risks of PRP and how important those long-term safety studies are. And of course, we touched on the cost and accessibility, which is a real barrier for a lot of people. So where do we go from here? What's, what's the next step for our listener who wants to learn more about PRP and, you know, its potential role in their fertility journey? Well, the most important step is to talk to a qualified reproductive endocrinologist. Okay. They can really look at your individual situation, discuss what you want to achieve with treatment, and determine if PRP is a good option for you. It's also important to, you know, to stay up to date on the research. Oh, yeah, absolutely. New stuff is coming out all the time, and what we know about PRP today might be different tomorrow. And finally, remember, you are not alone on this journey. You really aren't. There are so many resources out there to support you. Mm. You know, online communities, patient advocacy groups, even mental health professionals who specialize in fertility challenges. Lots of support out there. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for guiding us through this deep dive. It's been fascinating. It really has. It's been my pleasure. And to our listener, remember, stay curious, ask questions, and, and advocate for your own reproductive health. You got this. You know, it's really amazing to think about all the, like, the potential applications of PRP. Yeah. Even outside of, you know, infertility. We've, like, barely scratched the surface of what this treatment could do. Yeah, it's a field that's moving so fast, and I'm really excited to see what comes out of future research. There's just so much we're still learning about, you know, the power of these growth factors. Okay, so before we wrap up this deep dive, I want to leave our listeners with something to, to think about. We talked about PRP's potential in, you know, reproductive medicine, but we also touched on those broader possibilities. I'm uh, I'm intrigued. What are you thinking? Well, we talked about how PRP is being looked at for things like, you know, wound healing and sports injuries, but what if we go further? Could PRP play a role in addressing, I don't know, some of the bigger health challenges we face, yeah. like like aging or chronic diseases? That's a that's a fascinating thought. I mean, if you think about those growth factors, VEGF, TGF beta, PDGF, 
they're not just involved in repairing tissues after an injury, right? They're also involved in the the ongoing maintenance and regeneration of our cells and organs. So, so theoretically, could PRP be used to, I don't know, slow down the aging process or even reverse some of the damage that, that comes with age? It's possible. It's definitely something that researchers are starting to explore. Imagine using PRP to, you know, stimulate the regeneration of skin or improve cognitive function or even repair damaged heart tissue. Those are some uh, some pretty big ideas. They are, but but the early research in these areas, I mean, it's it's showing some promise. Of course, we need a lot more research to really understand the long-term effects and, and the risks, but it's a really fascinating area, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more research on PRP in the years to come. It's kind of neat to think about, you know, the potential for PRP to not just address the health challenges we're facing now, but like actually shape the future of medicine. Absolutely. I mean, PRP could be one of the keys to to unlocking a whole new era of regenerative medicine. I think that's a that's a perfect note to end on. This has been such a fascinating deep dive into, you know, the world of PRP. We covered, well, we covered a lot. The science, the potential applications in infertility and, and beyond. It's been a real pleasure exploring this with you. And to our listeners, you know, stay curious, keep learning, and, and remember, the world of medicine is constantly changing. And who knows what amazing discoveries are waiting for us. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the world of PRP. We hope you found it informative and insightful. And as always, please talk to your healthcare provider to discuss any questions or concerns you might have. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring.